What's up guys? My name is Brandon. Welcome to Quick Flicks. Today, we are diving into the fifth and final installment of the Purge franchise, The Forever Purge, directed by Everardo Gout. With James DeMonaco returning as writer and executive producer, The Forever Purge is the direct sequel to The Purge Election Year, where we saw that President-elect Charlie Roan had promised to abolish the annual holiday. Well, we can see that didn't work out how she intended. The Forever Purge asks what would happen if people ignore the ending of The Purge and made all crime legal, well, all the time. The Forever Purge, unlike its predecessors, unfolds over the course of a couple of days, rather than just one night. This change offers a unique opportunity to explore the societal impact of a never-ending purge. So let's buckle up and see what kind of chaos unfolds in the states this time. movie opens up in a desert, where migrant couple Juan and Adela are led through a cave system that takes them from Mexico into Texas. Adela is played by Ana de la Rogueda, and please don't make fun of my pronunciation too hard, I'm trying here, who you may recognize from Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead. Their guide tells them that if they ever find themselves in trouble, a rose symbol will lead them to safety. He then sends them on their way as they enter the United States. This leads into the opening credits, where some dialogue fills us in on what has happened in the country over the last few years. We learn that after Charlie Roan's presidential term ended, the new founding fathers of America were voted back into power and reinstated the purge. We also learn that mass migration and white supremacy are on the rise, again. Ten months later, just one day before the start of the first purge since its reinstatement, Juan has gotten a job domesticating horses at the Tucker Ranch in Tejas. Old man Caleb owns the ranch, where his daughter Harper, son Dylan, and Dylan's pregnant wife Cassie work. Caleb admires Juan for his ability to calm and break horses, while Dylan is a bit jealous and also just a nitty bit racist. I don't even know if I want our kids speaking Spanish in this house. But when Juan voices his concern to Caleb, Caleb assures him that Dylan's just butthurt over not being able to break the horse. Mm, but I beg to differ. At home, Adela tells Juan that if he improves his English, he will have a better relationship with the Tuckers. Speaking from experience, Adela has taken to America, practicing English and becoming second in command to her boss, Darius, at her butcher shop job. An hour before the purge starts, the Tucker family locks their home down while Adela and Juan, along with fellow ranch worker TT, take a school bus to hide in a heavily protected warehouse with other migrants for purge night safety. As everyone settles in, we get our classic purge warning, now in English and Espanol. Once the sirens ring, all heck breaks loose. We get a fun montage of your typical purge night related activities, you know, people dying everywhere. While in the warehouse, Adela shares her optimism at how exciting and promising it is to be in the United States. Juan's skepticism from daily incidents of racism and of course, the purge, keep him from being optimistic. But with Adela's beaming enthusiasm, it sparks a hint of hope in him. Aww, they're so cute. She steps out for a moment to get some fresh air when trucks labeled Purge Purification ride by. From their loudspeakers, they blare messages of cleansing the country of anyone impure and non-American. Disturbing Adela, who picks up a rifle and sees people captured and being tortured in the back of the truck. She gets tempted to help as she has an opening for a free shot. But an armored guard stops her, telling her that the truck doesn't know about her and the other migrants hiding, and that if she shoots, they'll turn around and raid the warehouse. She stands down, leaving the guard wondering how this lady knows how to handle a rifle so well. A few hours go by, and the purge alarm rings. The night is over, mother heckas, meaning everything is back to normal. Well, normal enough. I mean, I guess. What is that? A wolf? Coyote? I don't know. Well, hey, at least the purge is over now. This jumpstarts our first look at what the title of this movie hints at, The Forever Purge, with Adela and Dylan Tucker being ambushed and trapped in their respective workplaces, Dylan by some unlawful cowboys, and Adela by some spooky bunnies. About to die from what I think is a captive bolt-like object, Adela's boss, Darius, comes to the rescue, taking on the bunny people. It's a pretty brutal and gnarly fight, with Adela and Darius getting the upper hand on these fools. Shortly after, the cops show up, 
and arrest them for killing outside of Purge Night. Meanwhile, TT and Juan get to the ranch for what they think will be a normal day of work, but instead find the entire Tucker family bound and gagged by the masked cowboys, who they find out is led by their employee, Kirk. His motivation being jealousy and low wages, he proclaims the forever purge in an attempt to take over the ranch. Old man Caleb confesses that the ranch hands are absolutely right. The rich do exploit the poor and have exploited working poor and minorities since the founding of America. He goes on to try and wake up the ranchers to the fact that they participate in what is essentially their own genocide and would be class traitors. But he gets a little spicy with the language, and Kirk, not liking that, shoots him in the head. Juan and Titi, who have been watching from afar, find the Tucker's weapon cabinet and take action, killing Kirk and a few lackeys. Titi, Juan, and the Tuckers regroup and leave the ranch in their sleeper truck. Meanwhile, the butcher shop duo is restrained in the back of a police van with a Nazi and a very happy forever purger who keep ranting about how there is no crime anymore, and that the first forever purge is the real purge. You know, these people seem pretty crazy. Like, I wonder what they do on regular days. Like, what were they doing days leading up to this? I don't even know how they could be normal people in society. Like, how did they even contain themselves? Because they just seem unhinged. Well, what were their lives before the purge? They are visibly turned on by the sounds of violence, screaming with glee, until a purger shoots an RPG directly at them hitting the van and killing the woman. The man falls on top of Adela and tries to assault her, but she and Darius fight back, with Adela gouging the man's eyes out and Darius strangling him with his handcuffs until he breaks the man's neck, killing him. Outside of the van, they hear forever purgers trying to get in, but when the doors open, Juan, Titi, and Harper Tucker are on the other side, who may I add is a complete BA, blasting purgers out here. They get into the escape truck, driven by Dylan, but Darius lets Adela know that he wants to find his family and leaves the group. The group freaks on out of the city, where we get a cool shot of the doomed Austin, Texas. Miles away, the group raids an abandoned motel for supplies. TT and Harper find time to flirt, while Adela comforts the pregnant Cassie. A news report comes on, stating that the forever purgers will be handled with extreme prejudice, as the NFFA enact martial law, sending the military into every major city. A different newscast on the radio states that Mexico and Canada have opened their borders for refugees, but only for the next six hours. And since the forever purge has already spread across the country, back to Mexico we go. Better get a move on, time's ticking with only six hours. As they travel, Juan confronts Dylan about his apparent prejudice towards Mexicans. Dylan insists that he does not believe that white people are superior to any other race, but rather that different cultures will never truly understand one another, and therefore should not attempt to mix or engage in any intercultural relationships. While Juan is somewhat in agreement, their truck is suddenly attacked by a group of forever purge vigilantes on motorcycles. The situation appears dire, but Harper quickly thinks on her feet and brandishes a flag belonging to the Ever After group, effectively throwing the assailants off their trail. The group finally arrives in El Paso, with just three hours until the border closes. It's a full-on war zone, with riots, tanks, crashed cars, and blockades everywhere. The group is forced out of the truck as they can no longer make forward progress and try to make it to the border by foot. We follow the group in a long shot, TT taking out two purgers, and Dylan killing another. They eventually reach a theater, but a tank blast damages the building and creates too much debris for the men in Harper to enter. The group becomes separated, but agrees to continue on their own in an effort to reunite. As Adela and Cassie make their way through the theater, Adela John wicks a couple of purgers disguised as vampires. The ladies continue on when they see a rose, the symbol that the boy who snuck them into the US at the beginning told them to look for if they ever got lost. She decides to follow the path and tells Cassie along the way that during her time in Mexico, she was an anti-cartel vigilante, which explains why she's such a BA. Back outside, Juan also comes across the rose symbol and the group decides to follow it, but they are soon confronted by a group of purifying purgers, led by a man named Alpha and his wife, who they refer to as Mother. Alpha doesn't like that Dylan and Harper, who he quotes are true Americans, are with TT and Juan just because, well, they're Mexican. 
Yep. Alpha offers Dylan and Harper the opportunity to go free if they kill Juan and Titi. The Tucker siblings refuse, and in retaliation, the purifiers kill Titi. Some NFFA soldiers arrive just in time, however, to eliminate most of the purifiers, and in the chaos, Juan manages to kill Mother. The soldiers are quickly wiped from an RPG blast, and the surviving members of the group escape, but Alpha calls for backup as they flee. Adela and Cassie keep following the Rose Markers until they come across the final one, leading them to a safe house run by a group of Native Americans, where they reunite with the others. They've arrived just in time for a news announcement declaring that El Paso has fallen. Due to severe attacks on military bases and NFFA facilities to forever purge forces, and that the border will be closed immediately. Luckily for the group, though, a lady named Lydia steps forward and instructs one of her comrades to fetch Chiago, a respected Native American leader renowned for his fierce opposition to the purge. He arrives with a truck and agrees to help the group cross the border to Mexico through his reservation. On the journey, Cassie suddenly starts going into labor, but Dylan's attention is diverted when he spots Alpha and his crew on the way. They eventually reach the crossing point and ditch the truck, knowing they will have to travel the rest of the way to Mexico on foot. Dylan chooses to stay behind with Adela and Juan to help protect the group from Alpha's gang, while urging Cassie to safely give birth in Mexico, with Harper serving as her bodyguard. The Tucker ladies leave, and Chiago's forces realize they are low on ammunition. Chiago instructs them to shoot what they can, and prepare for hand-to-hand -hand combat. The battle breaks out with Chiago's tribesmen firing explosive arrows at the guiding vehicles, and blowing them fools up. After exchanging gunfire and some people dying, Alpha and his crew abandon their buggies and take advantage of the group's depleted ammunition by mounting a swift and aggressive attack, pushing forward while raining bullets into the RV. But the few survivors, Juan, Chiago, Dylan, Adela, and the Flaming Arrow Man, escape and take refuge in a mountain house. They prepare to use hand-to-gun combat by setting up inside. Juan and Adela say their final, just in case I love yous, as Alpha and his crew arrive. Chiago and Flaming Arrow slice and dice some of these purifiers, then leaving the building to protect the hills. They stealthily take out a couple more purifiers, one getting hit so hard that he Wilhelm screamed. Back at the hut, a motorcycle man breaks through a door and runs into Adela, knocking her unconscious. While she's out, Juan and Dylan fight off a few purifiers. Juan is eventually caught though, and his head is held to a running motorcycle wheel. With seconds to spare, Adela wakes up and hazily shoots Juan's attacker, saving him. After a breath of relief, Alpha snatches her through a window, holding her hostage with a machine gun and a knife. He wants her to call out for help, but she stalls, screaming in Spanish instead of English. This infuriates Alpha enough to drop her to her knees. While she stalls, Dylan and Juan work together to gruesomely take out the rest of Alpha's men. Once Juan reaches the screaming Adela and Alpha, he uses that good old cowboy know-how to tie a lasso around Alpha's throat. Dylan lassos around the other side to disarm him, and with a final gunshot to the head, Juan takes care of Alpha once and for all. Chiago and Flaming Arrow bring Adela, Juan, and Dylan to the border. They've officially made it to Mexico. He leaves them be, and the three make their way to the medical tents to find Cassie, Harper, and a little purge baby girl. Overwhelmed with gratitude, Dylan expresses his heartfelt thanks to the couple in Spanish. The movie ends with the radio saying that there are two million American refugees, with the remaining Americans banding together to fight the forever purgers, and the NFFA crumbling as the United States burns. The screen then cuts to black. And that wraps up the Purge franchise. Let me know what you thought of the Forever Purge. Did you like it? Hate it? Was it your favorite in the franchise? In fact, let me know your ranking of the entire franchise. I'm really interested to know your guys' thoughts. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next one.